Welcome to Lecture 3 on Campaigns and Elections. We left off discussing things called direct democracy elections. The initiative and the referendum, also known as ballot measures, are a form of direct democracy. 24 states have the initiative process. This is a, a proposed where a proposed law or policy change is placed on the ballot by citizens or interest groups for a popular vote. Also, 50 states have what's known as a legislative referendum. This is where a proposed law that's proposed by a legislature is referred to the public for a vote of approval or rejection. Ballot measures such as these allow voters to make laws directly without intervention by political parties or government officials. Also, some states have what's known as a recall election. This allows voters to remove state officials from office before their terms expire. Recalls of governors include the removal of Governor Gray Davis in 2003, where um, Arnold Schwarzenegger eventually won the uh, governor's office. Also in 2012, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker won a recall election and remained in office. That's basically all we need to know about elections. Let's talk a little bit bit about election campaigns. A campaign is essentially an effort by political candidates to win the backing of donors, activists, and voters. In other words, they need to win a lot of support to get into office. There is something called an incumbency advantage, meaning the people who already have the office have a decided advantage over any challengers. This includes staff support, direct or indirectly support the incumbent through constituent service, their increased visibility, their easy access to media, generous travel allowances, and what's known as the scare off effect. Challengers may at some point shy away because of the incumbent's institutional advantage, but incumbents still lose. Why do they lose? Well, sometimes they could their district can be redrawn where a whole new uh, type of voter is brought into the electoral process. There could be scandals. Um, the, their party, whichever party they belong to, could be very unpopular at the time. Um, the presidential coattails, the president could be popular or not popular. It could either drag down their election chances or help them. To campaign, any candidate is going to have to have a structure similar as this. They're going to have to have a campaign manager, a media consultant, pollsters, financial advisors, press spokespeople, staff director to coordinate volunteer and paid activities. These organizational structures are critical for success because national and statewide candidates need to appeal to directly as many people as possible and they need to retain professional campaign consultants. They work to craft a campaign message. They conduct public opinion polls to find out what the people want or what they think of the candidates. They produce TV and media ads. They open field offices to basically direct door-to-door um, -door operations. They look at data to try to find the most effective message and the best way to reach out to the people, be it whether it's uh, text, emails, you know, or trying to solicit donations, all of these things. So we'll kind of touch on each one of these sectors as we go through the lecture. Fundraising is critically important. Candidates must begin by raising money early. Many candidates spend more time soliciting donations than actually engaging in all other campaign activities. Serious fundraising efforts include trying to appeal to both large and small donors. Once elected to office, members of Congress actually find it easier to raise money because essentially of the campaign um, incumbency advantage. Because once you get in the office, it's easier to maintain that office. So if we look at two tables, 
from 1984 to 2020 that shows the average congressional campaign expenditures. You'll see House incumbents here in green generally have more money raised than House challengers. And it's almost the same in the Senate and the Senate challengers. There are two important campaigns that actually occur within the general election campaign. The first is a grassroots campaign. This is a political campaign that operates at the local level, often using face-to-face -face communication to generate interest and momentum by citizens. It is people intensive. It requires volunteers to go knock on doors, to hand out leaflets, to organize rallies. It's very important for local and congressional candidates who run in smaller districts. Now, other strategy concerns the mass media campaigns. Uh, this is media driven and it's very money intensive. It's very important for statewide, sometimes congressional and presidential candidates. In other words, grassroots campaigns work best for smaller districts where you can cover more ground. In the larger campaigns, say like you have to campaign in the state of Texas or nationwide, you, you want to typically do both, but sometimes you're limited. You can only do so many campaign rallies. So it's, you know, you have to develop both of these to have an effective strategy to win. Also, you need to develop a campaign message. Candidates must communicate their position on the issues that are important to their constituents. To create an effective campaign message, the candidate must consider the following. What's their record on the issues? Does the candidate's record on the issues mirror those of the electorate? The depth of the candidate's record, or lack thereof, will determine whether the message is either positive or negative. Now, the strongest influence, the extent of the candidate's record on any issue versus their opponent. If the, if the candidate has a stronger record, you generally adopt a positive message. If the opponent has a stronger record, you adopt a negative message. Other factors that influence the message are the competitiveness of the race. If the race is uh, not competitive, if you're going to win, you generally stay with a positive message. However, if it's very competitive, then the message has a tendency to be negative. Also, there's party ownership of the issues that voters care about. If those issues are generally seen by the, by the public as being issues that your party is better on you will campaign on those issues if it's not then you'll generally ignore it and try to bring up other issues early in the campaign most of the candidates will focus on their background their family how they you know how their life is going or how successful they are later campaign information will focus more on the issues that voters care about candidates frame their campaign rhetoric to increase the salience of the public's historical perspective of their party on certain issues. Each party has crafted an image and reputation with the public for being better suited to deal with a particular issue. Candidates often argue along lines that play to the issue strength of their party. Now, continuing on with the media. Media exposure is critical for campaigns to reach and to mobilize voters. Most presidential and many congressional candidates spend money on paid media in the form of 15 to 30 second TV and radio ads. These ads establish the candidate's name recognition and favorability. They communicate the candidate's stance on the issues that voters care about. They also attempt to link the candidate to a desirable group in the community. In addition to buying ads, candidates also try to generate free media coverage. This media coverage is obtained when the media cover a candidate's statements and activities as news. Also, digital media may offer large benefits to campaigns these days. Every campaign for president, Congress, or other major state office develops a social media strategy. 
This is used for fundraising and helping to mobilize their supporters and voters. In campaign advertising and political advertising, you have to remember that it's uninvited, it's unwelcome, and its influence is entirely debatable. For the message to be effective, it must resonate with an individual's predetermined disposition, their biases, and their level of knowledge. Campaign advertisements as a mean of persuasion depends upon three factors. Exposure, you have to see the ad for it to have an effect. Reception, you actually have to understand what's being talked about. And last but not least, acceptance. The message must influence one's preferences, opinions, and attitudes. Now, negative ad, uh, advertising, which I've included some videos, uh, is definitely is, is basically defined as talking about the opponent in a less than flattering manner. Voters are more accepting of negative messages if its subject matter is considered relevant to governing. Every candidate in competitive races must differentiate themselves from the other, and as such, the term becomes more or less meaningless. The influence of negative messages may be due more to the coverage of the negative ads in the media rather than the ads themselves. We're going to end there.